You are listening to Inside the Notes. I'm your host, Erica Block. Here we have the opportunity to listen to the stories that connect our musical family tree. First-hand accounts of performances, musicians, and mentors that shape the way we listen, learn, and teach. On today's episode, we're chatting with Principal Horn of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Jennifer Montone. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'd love to start out with a really big topic. Um, when I was researching things to do with my students in the spring during COVID, I bumped into your website and found just everything that you have on there. Your education tab is like the most well thought out tab I've ever seen oh. with books, things to do to stay healthy, how to work on mental health, work on mental preparation. And just, I loved how much you shared about that. Sometimes those turn into secrets. Um, so I would love to just jump in. I know we're fast forwarding a lot, but to start off with talking about your mental preparation journey Um, obviously you have a lot to say about the end result and what you do now, but how did you get there? And when did you start kind of trying to work through that jungle and figure out what you were going to do? Cool. Well, first off, thank you so much about my website. Yeah. I, a couple of years ago, I was trying to figure out like what, um, like I needed some projects, I need some goals and I needed some like new thoughts and ideas of things to do. And it was like my kids, I, I, I have two kids who are six and eight and they were starting to kind of get to like normal school. And I was like, all right, now's the time. So, um, so yeah, so I started thinking about like what, um, what has been helpful to me and I had two injuries. And so I had these two rebuilding processes that have happened during my career. And so, and they've had a mental component, which has been kind of wicked, but also there's been like this physical building of what my playing now is and rebuilding of what it, you know, used to be and everything like that. So that's sort of why I started getting sort of obsessed with the idea of having an educational wing to like my website or like just, you know, like to to figure out how we do what we do. And then if something goes wrong, how can you get better than you used to be? Not only rebuild what you used to be, but actually be healthier and wiser and a better teacher and like, you know, more compassionate to yourself and others, like all of this. Cause I think there's all this potential for growth whenever you have something slammed down on you, which the pandemic is a pretty good (laughs) example of that. Like you see all these beautiful creative things that the, especially the younger generation is doing is like amazing. And it's all because all of this stuff is happening. That's not ideal. Anyway. So, but back to the mental thing. Um, I just find that all very inspiring, but and the mental thing has been a huge process because of course French horn it's a it's a can of worms. Like it's right. more of a mental feat almost than it is a physical feat. Yeah. Um, once you get to a certain level and then you just want your you want to be consistent. You want to be able to like put your heart and soul out there and have your technique be solid enough and your foundations be firm enough that you feel safe doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the trick. So um, for me, it like started, I guess, at Juilliard. Um, I studied with Julie Landsman, who, as mm-hmm. you were saying, you spoke with. And um, she kind of got me into just uh, the, the mindset of, and all of our students, I think it's like, this is a skill set that you develop. It's a separate skill set than you're playing. It's like you, you improve as a player. Great. Then when you start putting yourself out there more and more, and you notice how different it is, your quality level, when you're performing, it takes a nosedive because it's not, you know, as comfortable as when you're in your own house practicing. Right. And it's, that's the evening out that needs to happen. And so you just chip away at that. So the way that she kind of helped me build that concept into something that made sense and helped me feel safe and firm was that um, there's like, there's all these resources, these books and websites now and everything like um, it started with Don Green. She was having Don Green come and teach at our horn classes and he would watch us perform and he'd be like, wow, that was interesting. Like you were in the zone, you seemed focused. And then all of a sudden I saw your eyes wildly, you know, somebody coughed and then you were aware of the audience. And then you were like staring at Julie, searching her face for approval, for instance. It was like, interesting. Yeah. What did you think about? What were you thinking about when that was happening? You know, he would give us sort of a postmortem on all of our horn classes. And then he was like, and how did you redirect? Was it a physical? Was it a mental? Was it a musical? Like, what did you think about to get yourself back in the zone? And how successful was that? when you did it and what could we work on with this so it was very self-exploratory and kind of without being judgmental it was very like self-aware and it was like it was kind of that 
root that sort of has grown for me and that I, I love because it's um, it's like you utilize the resources around you in order to make something better for yourself. You know, you take kind of ownership of like this I can do this falls out my window. How do I get that to be um, a more solid thing? So, yeah, I, I do love like Noah Kagiyama, um, who works at Juilliard now has this great website with these um, it's called Bulletproof Musician. And I love looking at his website and I'm on his little, um, uh, you know, uh, email blog thing. And Jeff Nelson has something called Fearless Musician, which is also really amazing and inspiring. And then, um, you know, there's all these books like I love you are a badass that's my new my newest one that I've read mm. but there's a ton of them going back to for like you know the inner game of tennis or soprano on her head there's just a million books and then there's um then there's kind of the part of it for me that becomes physical and I think we all learn differently obviously but um so if you're kind of more of a physical learner, you like when people describe things to you, you want to feel what it is. If the feeling component is more helpful for you, then things like the foundation of um, like the air and the rhythm and, you know, kind of the feeling like for horn players, it's support, the feeling of getting the air in and giving a good air out. And then like I find that very solidifying sometimes too. Like I had a back injury. So now I, re I feel more um, vulnerable physically than I used mm -hmm. to. So now something like just subdividing in a loop, but subdividing in the style of whatever I'm playing, breathing along with that subdivision in the style of what the piece is, and then having sort of physical indications like I'm going to subdivide, I'm going to crescendo my subdivision to this high pickoff, or I'm going to, you know, change my support to be a different part of my torso, or I'm going to breathe from a different part of my, you know, of my stomach than, you know, like my chest rather than my stomach or something like that. Yeah. All these physical sort of things, or I'm going to feel my feet on the ground, or as I go high, I'm going to um, sort of go into my sits bones. I'm going to push my belly guts down into my seat um, so I can go high more effortlessly. So there's sort of, if, if that's reassuring, that's a good place to put your attention. And then, uh, but that's also like a self-awareness thing. You need to know, do I like to, you know, do I like to have adjectives in my head? Do I want to be looking at the back of someone's head and feel like I'm having a conversation with them? Like I can, I can play along with like bow lines really well. Like sometimes when I get freaked out, I just look at like a couple string players who I love the, how expressive they are when they play like Hal or like Yumi and our orchestra or whatever. I'll see the back of like the flute head when I'm playing scary things, you know, um, and like seeing the cueing and seeing kind of the movement and everything. I'm like, Oh, I'm with friends. I'm just playing. I'm just talking, you know, and that kind of helps me. Um, or I'll go into like my own world. I'll be like, oh, well, this is a love. This is a love song. Chike five. I'm going to, you know, say like, I love you. This is how much I love you. This is what I love about you. I feel bad about the fact that da da da. And I create my own yeah. story. Or I'll like think about my kids and be like, like life is okay because yeah. like there's, you know, it's like there are more important things than me missing a note. If I miss a note, it's okay. They're still fine, and they're right. still. Fine cute little people. I'm like, I can still do good in that. Well, so there's sort of, um, what I love about nerves is that, um, as crazy and intense as they can be and as surprising as they can, they can surprise us with being like, Oh, I thought I was fine. Then all of a sudden you're like, Oh God, I'm not fine. <laughs> yeah. But there's like as many problems as there are with them. There are that many tools as well. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there was a teacher, her name is Laura Dwyer. She's a flute player. She is a meditation and yoga sort of specialist for um, musicians. And uh, she taught me this amazing thing to do. I had heard about nose breathing and how it can calm down your neurology. But like, as you can tell, I talk fast. I go fast. Everything's fast. So when I get nervous, I go. <laughs> so I was like, oh dear, calm down, slow down. So like for me, this nose breathing thing like um, is amazing. You can like do nose breathing in and then hum. And if you do that, even during like a piece, or if you do it, especially for like 20 minutes laying down in a warm up room before you go on stage, you are in an alpha state. Like it is a complete like neurological reset. Cool. Yeah. And you can also do like nose breathing, holding your nose like closed, like half your nose closed and breathe. And then hold it for five beats or five and then let go of one side of your nose. You know, exhale, inhale, sort of like breathing in a square, like inhale, hold, exhale. All of that like calms down your um, body energy and your neurology part of you. And, um, and then enderol is good too. <laughs> so, like, yoga, meditation, enderol, those are all like very helpful, just like in general in life.
That's really awesome. Exploratory sort of like, what do I know about myself? What, are, what gets me in trouble? What do I find calming? What, what is helpful to me? And then kind of utilizing going down a, a path of tricks to use and tools to use when you're in the midst of something. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about getting hurt. Um, cause I definitely have had my own experience with that. Um, obviously on a much less intense scale, but it's very scary. And so in a position where you are, it's incredibly scary because you do spend a decent amount of time performing hurt, trying to figure out how to get not hurt. Um, and there's terror that comes with that because you start not trusting yourself. So since you've had to do it twice, um, how do you, how did you find a way to kind of balance the fear factor and the exploratory nature of needing to find someone who can help you? Cause sometimes it's crazy stuff that works. It's not the normal thing. So what was that journey trying to kind of stay focused, but explore and figure out how to solve the problem while you're doing your job? Right. Um, that's a good question. Um, so I, uh, yeah, so I had these two, I had a car accident that had um, turned into a jaw injury, which took me out of commission for like about eight months or so in when I was in St. Louis, it was a number of years ago. And then I was okay, but I started to have back injuries more and more frequently. And then that became kind of epic and constant. And then so about four years ago, I had a surgery. Um, I, I sort of, I pushed it too hard. I should have stopped at some point and just been like, I need to take care of my body. Boom. But instead I kept playing and I was, I was going to a physical therapist, but it wasn't enough to uh, counterbalance like the other stuff, you know, yeah. the, the load on my back. So anyway, so I ended up um, having a big surgery for that and then working back from that. And both times when I rebuilt, um, and like you said, like every injury, they're all very similar in that it's a, it's a physical rebuilding. It's a scary thing in terms of trust and how much can I push it without hurting myself more. And then there's a pride component too, and sort of an embarrassment thing, because mm -hmm. you have all these experiences where like, you're just not yourself, but you don't also it's harder to learn and improve if you keep yourself in your practice room all locked away for the yeah. entire process. There is a point at which it's helpful to be back in your life, whatever. And high, however high, uh, like high profile your life is, it's helpful to go out there and put yourself out there because that's experiencing your life. And it kind of reminds yourself where your goalpost is yeah. and then you get there. But in the meantime, you are going to sound very much less than yourself. And that takes a huge mental toll. And that was actually the thing that I found the most interesting this last time was that with my back injury, I was very aware that I was weakened because of the inside of my torso, like my, my, um, my spine actually has like holes in it now. And it's like, that's great. But it became sort of like, <laughs> I'm like now I'm weak great. and I'm faulty and I'm less than, and that, that becomes kind of a, a problem if you really internalize that belief. But I think yeah. we all feel like musicians were so sensitive to like, who am I in the world? And am I good enough? Like we have that just hanging over our heads, like some dark, scary cloud. And so it's like that if you have something that's sort of proof positive, like, yeah, I'm not as even as good as I was before. And before I might not have been all that great either. You know, right. but now right. less, it's like, oh, shoot. So anyways, so it's kind of like, there's this rabbit hole that you can go down and you're right. It's hard to like get back on the horse. So um, yeah, there's like, uh, I feel like there was um, a combination of brainstorming, trying to find the resources. It was like, okay, like I need to do that. And then there was the healing, giving yourself enough time and then building back strength. So for me, it was, um, let's talk about my back. It was core stability. So it was like physical therapy, yoga for people with bad backs, now yoga and Pilates. And I'm kind of up to the more normal people core stabilizing. And my sound is getting more and more stable and my volumes are getting more extreme and I'm able to do more and more of what I wasn't able to do. And I'm like mostly back to normal. And that's like, incredibly exciting. Yeah. Um, but it has taken four years and I'm not a hundred percent. It's like, that's terrifying. So like just the time frame on it, like, and maybe I'm much more aware of it than most people, but the time frame of it is a bit brutal, just kind of naturally. And yeah. so it's very helpful that there's a lot of resources out there in terms of other people who've gone through it. There's this really sweet website that a friend of mine who also went through some top problems, um, Angela Cordell Bilger, mm -hmm. she put out and it's called Musicians Well. 
dot com. Mm-hmm. And she has all these stories from all these, you know, sort of high level professionals who have gone through massive injuries and accidents and things and just their whole mental process. And everybody's really honest about it. And I guess that's what feels the most beautiful about the Internet now. It's like like things like what you're doing. It's like we can connect and share and be more of a community and kind of help each other through when some when an injury and a you know, recovery is taking seemingly a million years and you're like, just yeah. feels like it's so far away from where you want to be. You can at least take heart in the fact that like, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. If I push through a lot of times, this works out really well. And occasionally yeah. it doesn't, but like often, like, you know, you can keep stay the path and you're going to get back to being able to express yourself on your instrument in a beautiful way in your career. So like, um, there's that part of it that's helpful. But also, I like I said, I became a little obsessed with like, what are the aspects of horn playing and how do I optimize my own self in those ways, which becomes really interesting in terms of teaching, because then you have all these suggestions for people. Right. So it's actually like kind of like a super fun way to like be a lifelong learner and keep on improving because you're like, oh, now I get it. It's like if my torso. um like starts to quiver when I get to a certain volume on a certain note, I can move my body another way. I can take a breath from a different part of my torso, engage different muscles to support that sound and like just kind of go from there. Like I can problem solve in the moment. Like if I hear a quiver, I can do something different. I can take a breath so I have fresh air or I can, you know, like push down or push up or do whatever. It's like, there's a lot of stuff you can do in the moment. And if I start getting nervous and tense, then I can sort of like relax my body and I can get some mobility in my shoulders and I can, you know, you know, start thinking about the line and I can phrase here and stuff. So it's basically like, it's been, um, the most exciting part of my injuries was the part of it that related to the brainstorming of how to, how to sort of get myself out of it. It's like a big corn maze or something. Totally. <laughs> you know? totally. And I think that's something that when people realize they're not alone and that a lot of people have been hurt getting into the corn maze with happiness and not into the corn maze with dread and like, oh my God, I'm never going to be the same. A lot of times when you find out on the other side, you have tons more tools, you are better. And, um, and maybe it was all for a good reason. Like you find out that you have more skill than you even thought you had because you aren't toughing it out the same way you were before, but it's hard to get, it's hard to get there. Um, it's it's so exciting when you hear people that, that do it or have had to do it multiple times and are still smiling on the other side. It helps with the duration because it's years and those years feel really, really long when you're in the middle of them. They're really rough. Yeah. Yeah. No. And the resilience aspect is interesting too. And I find this interesting also, I might just say when, um, when young players go through something like students of mine or whatever, or even colleagues or friends of mine go through something that's really rough, even if it's like the death of a loved one or a breakup or something like that, whenever tough things happen, I do notice afterwards, just now, like having taught for a long time. And I bet you do too. It's like you, you see this resilience that has grown and you see this thing of like life comes out your bell, comes out your instrument. And it's like, there's something gorgeous about that. Like, I just, I got to believe in that. It's like, it's maybe like, you know, maybe you're not practicing eight hours because you're dealing with like whatever, but like that life, that experience, that love and that pain and that whatever, like all the emotions, they're going to come out of your instrument in a beautiful emotional way. And I feel like that gets us so much deeper into like what the art form can be for society. And especially then you look at something like a pandemic like this and it's like, yeah, the arts could die, but they probably won't because I feel like, like chamber music is going to be like the big winner here. You know, maybe the house concerts are coming back. Like, you know, there's sort of like, there's a personal aspect that people, you know, miss and, you know, like there's, there's sort of, I I feel like, yeah, it's an interesting allegory for like, like, um, maybe perfection's not the object, but soul and experience can be a beautiful byproduct of anything bad. Um, but yeah, I do find that, um, like also then if, if you've gone through an injury or a bad thing, any, any kind of bad thing, you tend to be able to like reclaim your cool when things go wrong in a performance, like your ability to just be like, Oh, but okay, whatever, Brahms. you know, it's like we, we, you just get a little bit quicker at that. And that's something that like I found like really, I'm very grateful for that. Absolutely. The, the blow of the moment doesn't hit as hard and you can right. see it that quicker. Yeah. I have sort of a, like, almost like I've been struck by lightning. Like when I, when I hugely mess up something and I'm like really humiliated, I get like a flash of electricity on me and I'm like, I got struck by lightning. And then I'm like, yeah, but I'm still here. And it's still, it's still yeah. 
<laughs> so I was like, yeah. okay, like, let me like redirect, you know, back in. But yeah, it's like, yeah, it's- that's, that's really cool. Um, we also have in common, our kids are the same age. So this experience, I think is, of course, it's another form of resilience because you had your way that you did things and the way that you practiced and the way your schedule was set. And then when you plop one baby in and then a second, the whole thing blows up. Um, how have you changed and kind of how do you do all of that and still teach and practice and play all your shows? It's, it's so much stuff to do. Have you found a better new puzzle that, that works for you? Oh, yeah. The word puzzle. I think that's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, probably every parent does yeah. it differently in terms yeah. of how they want their puzzle to be. Like I used to love like when I would read um, like baby books, they're like Dr. Spock. His yeah. first chapter is like, how do you want to do this? Yeah. And I thought that was so amazing. I was like, oh, how do I want to do this? Like, what would be my ideal? Like, what kind of balance do I want in my life? And oh my gosh, you mean I can create that? Like, I could choose to create that? Okay, I'll do that. So like, I, I feel like that, Um, like musicians, we have that. Like we can, you know, you can lessen a part of your career for a short time to be able to spend more time with your children if that feels like the most important thing. And then you can ramp it back up again and reach out and kind of like create new projects and get new, you know, whatever. It's like sometimes with freelancing, you can't give up everything because you're going to, you know, you're yeah. going to not get called back. So like you have to sort of do it with, you know, some sensibility, but like you can sort of squiggle around your career, you know, balance with your life. And I love that. And I can teach at different hours of the day and I can yeah. you know, do it while the kids are at art center after school, you know? So there's sort of all of that, which I love. Um, but then I guess like in terms of trying to be mentally there for everything that you are, and this is kind of for anybody in the profession, you, and even in school too, like you do have to switch gears. It's like, okay, I'm in class mode. I'm in practice mode. I'm in performance mode. And I think we take that when we become parents and we're like, oh, I'm in mom mode now. Now I'm in professional like performance mode, like nail my stuff and be, you know, like aware and open to the people around me but in this performance way. And then you've got your teaching mode where you're like, you're trying to see the person in front of you very clearly. And that's what I found really interesting is like, sometimes if I get too overwhelmed, I don't see anybody clearly. I don't see my kids clearly. I'm like, I'm phoning in my responses to them. I'm phoning in my responses to my students. I'm like, oh, take a bigger breath. And why don't you support that and sustain your line more? And I'm like, that is a cop out, Jennifer. That's not (laughs) your best teaching. You are not seeing the person in front of you and seeing what they actually need and giving them what they actually need and I'm like okay like so scale back like you need more rest you need more protein you need less work you need more like in the moment like whatever but you can problem solve that you know so you can kind of catch yourself and same with the orchestra it's like if you're too overwhelmed then you you know you're not you're not really enjoying your performances in the same way so anyway so I love that also like you know you sort of you tweak it and you find it and you kind of you know you make your mistakes and then you fix it the next time it's like all Right. right So it's just kind of this beautiful process. (laughs) It's kind of all about embracing all of these moving parts. And I think my next question for you is kind of that um, for the student. So uh, you have a really cool kind of blurb on the website about your kind of process for getting ready for an audition. And when I was reading it, um, something that really stuck to me was there's an element to it of how you had your weeks laid out where you can, you already can play the excerpt. And so for a student, it's really challenging because a lot of those excerpts remain elusive for a very long time. And you can't actually play the excerpt. You can work on playing the excerpt, but the tempo's not there or the articulation's not there or something's missing and you know it, and it's in your pile of to-dos. So how do they go through the process of preparing while the excerpt itself is still not there and adding the mental and adding the physical and adding all that. Do you have any thoughts on how, or how do you present that with your own students as they're still in the technical side, like kind of crammed in the technical side and it's not feeling confident to them? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, I think you're right. I think that continues for a very long time. And honestly, like coming back to auditions, um, a number of years ago, Philly went bankrupt. And I was like, oh, gosh. And then, you know, we're like, what is this orchestra going to look like going forward? And then at the same time, there were all these auditions. And I was like, oh, should I put, be putting myself out there for these things? Like, I don't know. Um, so it was like interesting coming back to like the possibility of auditioning as a professional. Even so, you're like, oh, how well do I actually 
like actually my foundation on these excerpts are not as good as they used to be like, you know, so it's not even like you get there and then all of a sudden you're there for life. Like you constantly have to come and rebuild these excerpts back up. Um, and that's the only way to kind of get all the bad habits out of them, no matter where you are. So I, I do like the, I love that, um, like weeding your garden kind of concept. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, cause there's always stuff that grows. Um, but anyway, that you don't want in there. Um, yeah. So, but anyway, from a student perspective, you absolutely, um, at some point, like, so you're improving on one line, you're playing. And then at some point you're going to want to get into the, like improving the consistency of your performance under pressure. And whenever you feel like that's the right balance or your teacher feels like that's the right balance. I think the thing is, is that that's when it's good to start taking some auditions and just know like that the part of the part of the object, it's process versus outcome. So it's not about winning those auditions. Like, sure, if something happens, that's great. But like, it's about the process of who am I today? And was this the best of myself that I can bring today? given who I am and where I am on this excerpt and where I am as a human. Like, you know, did I, like, is this the best that I could do today? And so I do a lot of meditations on that kind of thing. Like I'll do a visualization that, um, Julie Landsman taught me where you like, um, you breathe in like white clouds and you exhale black smoke and you do that for a little while until you're calm. And then you go down a staircase very slowly in your mind, like a walking meditation where you feel the steps, you feel your feet, you feel the left leg and the right leg, you feel the arm, the hands on the, on the banister, all this kind of thing until you're really like down into a very Zen state. And you can do this before performances for a couple weeks before. And then you imagine yourself at the event, no matter what it is. You imagine yourself going through and, and like warming up in the hotel room and then walking to the hall and then getting there and checking in and you see yourself problem solving through the whole thing. It's like, it's about you sort of like, oh, my lips don't feel good. Okay. Then I'm going to do some flexibility exercises. So the process of it is what you're sort of, um, uh, basically getting your body to memorize and then you have and then you have this round where again you solve all your problems you notice that you're not breathing well you notice that you're not doing you know that you're rushing through things or you notice that you're going sharp because your shoulders are tight you notice all the things you fix them in the moment and then the last thing you say at the end is as you're walking off stage you smile at yourself and you say that's the best that i could do today like that is me today. And it's like, there's something very heartening about like that, like the process of um, improving our consistency um, is something we need to practice. Like that's not going to come any for anybody. Like the first time you take an audition, it's not going to be your absolute best the entire time, unless you just happen to be super duper lucky. But yeah, it's like, you know, you are going to have things that go out your window. So that's why like mock auditions are really great. And then just, you know, sort of knowing and not seeing every time that you take an audition and don't advance, not seeing that as a failure. It's more just like, oh, okay. So like what went out my window? And a lot of times you can record yourself on your phone, like both your, your practicing, you can record your lessons that way you do a run through. You can record your horn class when you do a run through your studio class, your mocks for your friends and your family. And then sometimes you can even record your audition itself. And you can listen back and see what went out my window, what went crazy, what went awry. And then you can plan it into your excerpts and your things that, and your solo pieces that like, you know, where the likelihood is going to, you know, something's going to go wrong here. I can fix that in advance by thinking about this and you kind of hone in on it in, with your mind. But I think it's irrelevant whether you feel like the excerpt is performance standard or not. It's more just about training your mind and your body to be working together towards this goal of having something come out your instrument that you intended. The intention of your musical thought being able to be actually physically rendered by you. And no matter where you are in the improvement of it, that's always going to improve, hopefully. Like we're always going to hopefully have that drive to keep on improving our technique. And, you know, and like you will get more and more opportunities as you keep on improving that. But the right. goal with the performance process, I guess it's maybe for me, it's the changing your mindset from like practice mindset, which is very critical and very um, like analyze while you're <laughs> while you're playing it, you're analyzing everything um, right. when you're practicing as a student or a professional. And then when you switch to performance mindset, that you sort of you have to like perform and give your give your heart and kind of you you babysit your technical things but it's right. more about staying like mentally aware of what's happening you're kind of you're problem solving but you're performing your beautiful emotional you know like artistic presentation basically right. you're trying to communicate instead yeah. of analyze yeah yeah exactly yeah so you're less critical and more giving and loving right 
Right. That's amazing. So going way back, um, when do you think, do you, do you know the moment when you really fell in love with music and you're like, oh, this is so it, I'm totally doing this. I love it so much. Was it a performance? Was it something you did or something you heard? It was a time period. Yeah. It was like, um, I started, I started playing when I was 10, so fifth grade, and I loved it. It was really fun. Um, but then my sister plays clarinet, and she's four years older than me. And um, yeah, she's been playing with like St. Paul a bunch and Minnesota Orchestra and stuff like that. She's uh, been a musician in the Twin Cities for a while now. And um, so she was, you know, a couple of years ahead of me in school, of course. And she was in the youth symphony that um, I was in the junior youth symphony for. And so the summer before my um, freshman year, they needed an extra horn. And so I got to go on tour with them. So I got to go to Europe, to Scotland, with my sister's youth symphony. And she was graduating and all of these seniors were graduating. They were amazing. A lot of them happened to just be going into music. So it was like by far the best like musical environment I had ever been in. But also it was like all these people that I idolized by going to her concerts all the time. It was like I saw them like they were like hardworking and they were going into the field and all these different conservatories and, and universities. And I was like, oh, you can do that? Like, whoa, you're kidding. And so just like, you know, it's like, and then you end up being in a life in music where you can travel and go and do cool things and be part yeah. of this community. I think I wasn't all that um, socially, I don't know, I'm not very socially savvy. So like, I felt always sort of like an outcast a little bit in school settings. And we were in a big high school and middle school and all this. So it's like, I felt kind of lost. And then so the musical community has been like such a nice thing, because it's all these like minded people. Totally. You know, we're all a little like quirky and we're all a little <laughs> and we're all a little weird. And it's like, but you're all lovely and like loving people and we all just take care of each other and we all like accept all those things and see it as a good thing. And so it's like it's just it's nice to be a part of that. But that was sort of the thing. It was like the 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 community plus the music and plus the like um I don't know, the whole lifestyle that it can be. Um I think I I like that it's different and weird and um yeah like a flexible and creative thing um so anyway yeah that was sort of the moment that did that and then I started I got in a um a fellowship program with the National Symphony and that you can go and see the orchestra rehearse and so my teacher Ted there he would give me um like the his horn parts his first horn parts and he would be he would give, give me a copy and he would be like follow along see what I do check it out from the first horn stands perspective and see what you hear and notice and I was like oh my gosh I love you so yeah that's sort yeah. Of, my thought of like like when you're going to a concert like really try to see it from a chair that you could actually potentially be in you know it's like sit behind the orchestra if you can behind the you know behind the winds and brass and like really feel what that feels like and see what the people are doing see how they're breathing see how they're interacting like be a part of the performance as much as you can and then you can go home later and play down the whole piece and like see what that makes you feel like like yeah. it's different after you've seen a live concert like we're all so hungry for that right now but yeah it's like so I love to play along with recordings a lot like whenever I'm feeling I'm um, too uh, bogged down and critical like uh, practicing I'll like just bring out a piece that I love and just like play along with a recording or I'll do like a whole project of Strauss tone poems and I'll just play first and fourth horn parts to it like all week long and I'm like that was my practicing that was pretty good stuff like I probably my body learned some things and I know my brain was happier so like that was that was good for me this week that's um, really cool and your ears hear something different when you're playing with than when you're just practicing that's yeah. really cool so once you got with him and were in that program, did was like was your eye set on Juilliard? Did you know you wanted to study with Julie, or how did your no. like getting to college happen? Oh yeah, um, so Mr. Thayer um, is like one of the most musical humans ever. So he, he was just so good for me. Um, and then I had another um, teacher idol, um, Sylvia Alamina, who's at second horn in National Symphony. And so the two of them, God, I'm like so like floored that I actually got to have that education in high school. Um, and like, so they both were really supportive of like anywhere you want to go, you know, whatever you want to do. And I had this colleague, Nikki Cash, who's an incredible horn player. Um, and she's was in San Francisco. She got to Estonia, but she, she and I pushed each other so hard and just sometimes having like a buddy, like I found in high school and in college, both, it was like, I, you know, in college, it was a, a guy named John Hamill, who I'm still really good friends with also. And it's like, you just, you push each other. And so if you find someone else who, even if it's not your own instrument, but especially if it is, 
is. It's like just to kind of like give you that ambition and that drive and yeah. um, and kind of like, how can you do that? I want to do that. <laughs> yeah. you know? So I would play duets a lot with both of them and kind of just like, ah, you know, and it's, it's nice to be propelled from outside as well as from inside. Um, so and then I did a, a lot of summer festivals like I did some Tanglewood stuff and I did music academy and it was good to like um and some local uh, summer festivals too I think summer festivals are really good for the high school crowd absolutely know where you are and again to like get a little bit of outside um inspiration and then I feel like a lot of times in student times we get all this input and you can't even, you can't get it out your bell in the four years where you are in high school or college. It just doesn't, it doesn't marinate and come out that fast. It's like a, it's like a cake. Like it takes yeah. a while. So like a lot of times, um, you know, we feel impatient with ourselves when we're a student because like our teacher's saying the same things over and over again, or like we keep on hearing the same comments and we can't seem to get it right yet. And it's like, I swear, like if we just keep on plugging away. And especially if you keep good notes, like, you know, either record your lessons and take some notes afterwards, or just, you know, like take five minutes after your lesson and write down the key points or like, you know, just like have there be some record so you can come back. Like I have sheets of music. My mom got me into this where I would play a solo piece for someone. I'd flip it over and I'm like, comments from Eric Rusk, 1997 wow. masterclass at Tanglewood or whatever. And I'm just like, huh? And I look and I'm like, I still struggle with that. Wow. But he had this cool idea that I could do blah, 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 blah. And so then I'll like introduce it to my practice session, like 30 years later, you know, and I'm like, yeah. wow, that guy's smart. He's really helpful. And it's like, you can pick up things from everywhere and you become right. this conglomeration of who knows who, you know, in your teaching and in your playing. But it's like, it's helpful just kind of remember like, it's not going to all seep in now and be out my bell now, but it'll seep in and I'll find the, I'll find the inspiration and you'll think it's your idea. It's like not so much your practice idea, somebody else's idea that they taught you a million years ago. You don't even remember, but anyway, regardless, or yeah. maybe it's your idea based off of what they taught you, but it's like, you're kind of, a, we're all a combination of what we've been taught and who we are and how we processed what we learned. And it comes out at different times, like, you know, a beautiful tree <laughs> like growing and each tree comes out at different times. And then, Absolutely. So I think it's also crazy sometimes when you realize if you're helping someone and something comes flying out of your mouth that was given to you, but you've never even processed it really, but it comes flying out anyway because you see it in someone else. Yes. So there's just oh. so much marinating. Teaching is the best practice tool. Oh my gosh. Cause yeah, you just, you learn so much by trying to figure out somebody else's things right. and helping them help themselves that then you end up helping yourself massively. So <laughs> totally. Yeah, it's all good. So when you got to Philly, obviously you were in Dallas and St. Louis before, is that right? Mm -hmm. Then Philly, was that your first principal job? Uh, St. Louis was, yeah. St. Louis was so your I first principal job. Juilliard, and then I had, I got third horn in the New Jersey Symphony, and I did that for three years, and then went to Dallas on third horn and associate, and then for one year, and then there was a splitting audition where they split that position into two positions, and so I took the, I won the associate audition, associate principal, and Nikki Cash, my buddy, who had like, you know, we had driven each other so hard. She won the third horn and it was hysterical because it was like, we had been competitive and friends, but competitive also for all these years. And then we cracked up when they announced it. We're both like, <laughs> almost crying. We're laughing so hard and people are looking at us like, what? And one of us said to the other, it was like, there's room for both of us. There's a place <laughs> for both of us. It was so perfect. It was such a good, like, like, okay, the world, like, you know, there's space for you, there's space for me. We like, we use competition. It was like something about competition and how we can use it to like, still like help each other. Yeah. Totally. It was just a beautiful ending for that. It was like, wow. You know? <laughs> it is. It's uncanny. It's incredible. Yeah, it was so cool. But anyway, yeah. So I was in Dallas for three years also. And then St. Louis Symphony for three years as principal there. And that was amazing because St. Louis is such like a warm and welcoming place and like they're just so um they're musically inspiring and I just I love these orchestras and how they it's like everywhere you go you learn all these things you know it's like Dallas like taught me how to be a professional you know and Jersey like help, helped me learn just how to be in an orchestra you know and then St. Louis helped me be like a principal and what to do with that um how to be a good leader how to not talk too much how to say the right things how to like you know deal with all of the leadership quandaries that we all sort of find in leadership in any setting. 
Yeah. So that's a great segue to now that you've been in Philly for several years, how, do you think your leadership has changed or have you figured out ways to hone it that you feel the most comfortable being in your seat and in your skin and how you interact with your section? Yeah. I mean, being older really helps. I mean, just mm -hmm. kind of getting enough years in the chair is immensely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I think probably, I think the things that I appreciate the most now with leadership is that um, like you've got this beautiful collegial relationship that you get the opportunity to build if you happen to be in an orchestra that plays frequently enough. Mm -hmm. And you can do this in school too. And that's the thing. It's like you can, if you enter a college and you've got a studio that like is, you know, rotating, but like a lot of the same people, you can build these relationships and the better the relationships are with each person, the better that section plays together. And the more kind of like understanding and passion you share between all of you, like that's the thing. It's like, um, so Dan Williams, our second horn in Philly, who just retired, he was like, he was like my older uncle when I got in the orchestra. It's like, he just, he was such like a shepherd and like, you know, and he had all these cool old stories of all this Savalish and like Ormandy and Mason Jones and all these. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, and yeah. it was just such like, he's like, you're doing great kid. You just keep it going. You know, he's like, he just was um, so supportive, but also very inspiring. And he loves music so much. And he just, it was constantly like, gosh, we get to do this. And that's so like reflective of how I feel also. It was so nice to sit next to someone who feels like that. Yeah. It's like, I get to do this with my life. Oh my God. And also like um, Ted Thayer was always like that. Like he would never say, I'm going to work tonight. He's like, I have a concert tonight. I'm going to the orchestra tonight. You know, it was like, it always was like, this is a privilege that we get to make this music together. And um, so anyway, I sort of, I feel like um, the whole thing with leading, it's like, it's, especially when you're younger, it's easier and much uh, more fail safe to uh, just lead with how you play. Yeah. And so things like being immensely prepared is a big deal for any professional situation. But when you're young, especially like when you're not, when you're just learning the repertoire and you're just learning how your part fits in with the world, um, you like, you really kind of need to do um, that, that whole thing of listening along with a score, playing along with recordings a number of times, watching your score and your part at the same, the score and the part at the same time, marking into your part, who's playing when, who had this theme before, like sometimes in the middle of rest, I'll have like, Oh, about exclamation point, because then I know I have that same tune later and I need to remember not to be just sitting there like resting and pouring out my spit. I need to actually listen to the oboe to see how they do it so that I can do it the same way later, you know, or like this is one, three, five, seven. So that I'm not surprised that two and four don't have their horns up. So I'm not like, what are you doing? What's happening? I'm like, right. I'm doing a section of four and it's not the people sitting next to me. You know, it's like, so you just kind of know what's happening and you know what your goal is. Or like I have DB for like, watch the baseline. They have the note values that we need to be matching our note values with, or they have the line that our harmony is progressing on. So like all of these things, they help you feel more confident once you're in a seat. And this works really well for freelancing too. Cause you're always like, when you get into a freelance situation, you're like, you're new, you're young. You're yeah. Oh, yeah. And you're like, Oh God, they're going to hate me. They're going to. Oh. So it's like, but if you're like very, um, very prepared and especially if you bring a score and you've got stuff in your part and you know what you're trying for. And when you make a mistake, you like, you write it in, <laughs> you know, things yeah. like that is really good for like being a young professional and showing that you're earnest and you're trying and you're learning and you're, you care, um, which is a big deal. Like, I think that speaks volumes. And I know like in auditions, like when we hear behind the screen, someone mess something up or go super sharp and then they return to the same note and they stabilize it or they blip something one time and then they're able to like, they, they time it better. You know, they stop doing whatever it is that they did wrong the first time you're like oh what a self-aware person must be a professional awesome I could work with that person like always like the you know the the mindfulness of being um being in the moment is like so good for a young person to try to go for when they're feeling a little frazzled um because then it, it sort of speaks volumes about sort of your potential as a real ensemble person and mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a big goal. That's great for, um, you know, for young leaders, but just young professionals in general is just to sort of show that you can be, um, you know, like a, a real functioning, happy, trustworthy, reliable, 
beautiful addition to an ensemble, whatever it may be. A lot of times you hear professionals say, oh, I made a mistake in my audition and I still won, or it was okay and nobody did a perfect audition. Um, but for students to realize that it's that kind of stuff that you're talking about, like being aware enough to make make an adjustment to show that you were aware of it and it's been fixed already, that that's so um, kind of rewarding to know that the uh, that the panel is listening for those kinds of things, not just perfection, but oh, yeah. yes, this person can actually fix it. That's great. Right. Yeah. And even like a, like an excerpt, like I have, I put like stars and exclamation points when somebody like just d nose dives on an excerpt and then they like, you hear them, they spend more time after that excerpt, they regroup. You can yeah. almost hear them breathing. You can feel them just like shedding like the water off the duck back. You're like, what the was that? <laughs> and then you're like, okay, baby, calm. All right. Yeah. Moving on. Okay. And then you hear them like just getting their mojo back and you're like, yes, you do that. You yeah. are awesome. And it's like, just as a listener and you feel that too in, audit in, in ensembles, like you feel someone just like, like destroy something. And then you see them put themselves <laughs> off the floor and they're just like, no, -uh, not happening. I'm doing this. I'm going to continue. Well, you know, <laughs> you're like, I'm not giving in. And yeah. it's, just, it's such a palpable feeling. And it's like, um, there was this conductor, Otto Werner Mueller, who um, is an amazing pedagogue. He taught at, um, conducting at Curtis and Juilliard. And I got to work with him and he would say, like, mistakes have babies. And it's true. Mistakes have babies. But also so does that, like, either resilience or artistic, like, putting yourself out on a limb. Like, when somebody plays a beautiful solo and really, like, puts themselves out there and does something beautiful, it's a palpable feeling. You can then, you're, like, everybody around them is just like, oh, yeah, let's do that. It's like, yeah, I'm going to make my diminuendo into an M ending even more glorious. I'm going to do that color shift on that harmony thing. Like, yes. You know, it's like, it's just really good to sort of stay in that um, collaborative and kind of you inspire me, I inspire you that like uh, interplay kind of feel. Absolutely. And I feel like your orchestra specifically does that amazingly, um, super that. inspiringly. Um, and I think that's my favorite part. I think that's why we're addicted to orchestra when you're in it, because when people start one upping and then you feel that love of camaraderie and, oh, I'm, I can do it too and watch this and you yeah. see it just start building, it gets out of control. Can you think of, I'm sure you have many moments, but some, a couple moments where you just felt the goosebumps from the whole ensemble and you felt like everyone was locked in and you really remember it as like a highlight for yourself? Oh, um, a couple times. So actually, well, one of the, probably the most memorable time was um, we did uh, Mozart Symphonia Concertante on um on tour and it was the tour that i you will in philly you get your tenure about like uh, maybe 10 months after you start it's yeah. a definitely short tenure process actually but it happens to be very intense um because <laughs> the amount of rep that they do um but like the the tour was at the end of the tour was when they were announcing all the tenure people, you know, whether you got tenure or not. So of course there was like a tour that had Chike five and um, Brahms one and Symphonia Concertante on it. I'm like, Oh my gosh, people like, dude, really? You know, so, like I'm terrified the whole time. And then, but we, it was like the first concert and um, we were in Chicago and it was like, somebody had told me Dale Clevenger was coming to the concert. I was just like beyond like off my board nervous and just like completely freaked out. And then we started playing this symphonic concert on, and I swear it, Dick Woodham's like looked at me and it was like, he, he winked. He like, he kind of like, you know, close yeah. to that, gave me a little like wink, like, Hey there, buddy. You know? And it yeah. was just, it was so great. And I was like, Oh yeah, I can't believe this is happening, but I guess we're doing this. And it was just kind of like, all right. And then I looked at Danny and he like looked all happy and nice and smiled. And, you know, I looked at Ricky and he was just like in his whole Ricky thing. And it was like, it just, it was like, okay, like just be here now and listen and try to like keep your feelers out as high as they can, you know, with like as, as sensitive as your feelers can be like utilize this energy force field because it was like, I think they were aware of the fact that this would be very scary for me. Cause I right. swear, I feel like they were helping. I feel like they were even more like warmly sending out collaborative vibes to me and supportive colleague vibes. And like, I think when we have those relationships, like you, you don't want to block those out. You don't want to be in your own little, like, you know, circle of hell where you're, where you're 
for yourself if people are trying to give you love and give you like the collaboration yeah they're like they're sending out these helpful things and these feelings of like let's do this together so yeah so that was actually one where I was able to like in the moment I I felt it strong enough I was able to attach to it and I was like oh yes this is safe this is beautiful and um I guess that's the thing like if um whenever I do feel sometimes I'll get freaked out and I'll be like, I have this like vamp in my head where I'll be like, I'm going to die. I got to go. I'm going to die. I got to go. I got to leave. You know, and it's like, clearly not helpful. You know, <laughs> okay, what else could I attach to in this scenario? Like there's got to be something that's more helpful than this guy inside my head telling me this. So it's like just trying to like, reach out in any direction and feel something that's more, you know, like a, a better train to jump on um and it can be like rhythm it can be you know line it can be the things from other people it can be the the music itself it can be anything but like something that's better than that so yeah there's so much humor in what we do too you're just like yeah well you know what is so this is so awesome this is like one of this is the reason why we were supposed to have this conversation that symphonia concertante you guys brought it to seattle and i was at that concert and It was that and Symphony Fantastique. And that is one of the most important concerts that ever happened to me in my life. I loved that concert and it was a huge, huge moment. Um, Because I I had not been playing for a while. There were several years that I didn't really play very many gigs and I had been doing another job. And after I left that concert, I was like, nope, this isn't working. I have to change everything and completely went a different direction back into playing and back into getting into gigs and it completely changed my life. So that was a very big concert, huge concert. And it was glorious. It was gorgeous. How about talk about like you did that. You like took a concert and let it like inspire your life to like change some stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, it was incredible. And I remember every note that you all played and the, the Mozart blew me out of my seat. And I remember <laughs> by the time we finished and went to intermission, I was like a wreck. I'm like, did you hear that? That was incredible. It was so much. And then um, I gathered myself and we went back to hear the Berlioz in like by the first like four bars. I'm like, I can't do this. <laughs> I can't <Right>. listen to <laughs> it. Too good. So oh, yes. Man. So I love yeah. that that was an important concert series for you as well because it really oh came through huge. We felt it. And Aww. it was awesome. It was awesome. One of my favorite That's concerts so nice. ever. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting though too. It's like the small world of our field. Like right. we we do this thing, like we do this thing that's interconnected. And you're right, like our world is so interweaved. Yeah. Um, but that's amazing. I love that about um, like letting music feed your soul, like allowing it in. I think that's the, like the most amazing takeaway on that is like, you know, like if we are able to get ourselves to a vulnerable point, we can let our art form actually like sort of feed our souls when we're having trouble other- otherwise, you know, like, um, yeah, I think that's really powerful. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's what we're doing. That's the purpose. Yeah. Um, and it's so hard with all the things we've discussed Uh, to get to the place where you're ready to emote and share and leave the critics alone and, you know, leave your mind to to be, but how you have like people's attention and you have a direct avenue directly into their heart and into their soul. And it can comfort or wrestle them or make them change, or, you know, you have this incredible power. Um, but it's just about finding a way to get to the place where you can enjoy that and not be terrified the whole time. Yeah. Well, and also like, yeah, I totally agree. And like the, um, I think the beautiful thing too, of like, um, like with this world, the way it is, like even just in the past, like 20 years, it's like orchestras used to be like the only thing it's like you as a wind player or whatever. It's like, well, your job is to try to get in an orchestra. It's like not the case anymore. Like there's so many ways to like be an important sort of inspiration to others in music that are not like even the big jobs, you know, it's like, there's just, there's so many ways that we can keep this connection going and kind of all like sort of feed each other's souls in every different direction, which is like, I don't know, again, one of them, maybe the coolest part about the pandemic with its regard in regards to the arts is like what we can creatively do to kind of keep that interplay 
amongst us. And that does also ease a little of the pressure of like trying to, you know, be able to relax and enjoy the art form and the art itself and giving of yourself to it is like not, um, cause it doesn't have to be the perfection and it, you know, it's like, you can make meaningful relationships and, you know, kind of have meaningful concerts, even if they're not perfect. And even if they're not in the fanciest of situations. So, you know, it's like every bit is good. Right. Um, You're still affecting your listener. Yeah, exactly. So during all this time, during all this COVID, have you found um, an opportunity to do something you don't normally get to do? Or has there been a little bit of like light for you of, oh, I've been practicing this thing, or I didn't do that. And I, built a table or like, was there something (laughs) else you got to do that kind of replenished your energy? Yes, I found, well, the pandemic um, has been a really psychological, psychologically interesting experience. I mean, I, I've had these two big injury times when I wasn't playing for a long time. So I know how to fill my time with like, you know, gratifying things and also like two, you know, maternity leaves where I wasn't playing for a length of time. And it's like, yeah, like I feel like both of those, all four of those absences from playing taught me like, okay, I'm not only a horn player. That's not my only purpose in life. Like the first one, the first injury was really, that was the big psychological thing was like, who am I if I'm not playing? What if my jaw isn't better enough to be able to come back and do this? Am I just like a failure as a person? And it's just, you know, it's like, was that it for me? Um, so it's sort of like trying to find some sense of self that wasn't coming out my mm-hmm. instrument. But um, but anyway, so like that, I feel grateful for those four experiences for kind of helping. So the pandemic doesn't feel that much different from that. So like we've been, I sort of, we turned our attention um, to the teaching in the spring, I think all of us who have students, um, and just like, oh my gosh, we have to make this semester and okay for these guys. Like I've got these students, like they deserve their education. So like, I think we all just like threw ourselves into that. Then the orchestra, Philly orchestra did a whole bunch of virtual things. So like, I've never done recording of like a chamber piece or a solo horn and piano piece, like where the, the people send me a track and I record my track over it. And then yeah. we put it together. Like we send it to a recording guy and he puts it together. And then I actually did this really cool project with, um, with solo pieces, uh, Clara Schumann songs. And mm. I have a friend, I've always wanted to do this. I have a friend who, um, who uh, is an art curator, kind of an art historian. And so she picked paintings of female uh, artists about, and I sent her the lyrics from the songs, the Clara Schumann songs. She read the lyrics and um, and found paintings of the same era as Clara Schumann from female artists about that kind of reflect the art very well I and mean, reflect the um, the lyrics very well. And so we put it together in this like virtual thing, and it's like really awesome. cool to do all these creative things. And um, it's neat to kind of like a lot of my students are doing layering projects of like horn quartets all by themselves, you know, they'll record all the tracks and it's like, you learn so much that way, you know? So like, I've been doing things like painting my cabinets in my kitchen and my husband <laughs> totally. and I like, like to go sailing and like we spend a ton of time with our kids, but like also just like the interesting things you can do just even with um, like you listen and you're listening to like that, that Clara Schumann thing. And also the Brahms trio, I did a first movement of a Brahms trio and it took me like, I mean, I felt like it was 75 takes. I just wanted to slam my horn into the wall. I was like, ah, this is so hard. Cause it's like, you get a clean take and then you're like, and I'm not together with them. And my <laughs> wasn't at the same rate as theirs. And I got, you know, I did more of an accent and I did less of a decay and I went sharp there and I went flat there and I ran out of breath there and I breathed too soon there. It's like, oh my gosh, like all the things. And you're like, yeah. man, ensemble skills are are a big can of worms. There's a lot to ensemble skills. And then, so like then Curtis started having faculty meetings about how do we make the fall okay? Cause we're doing online for the fall. And it's like, how do you teach online orchestra? What are the performance ensemble skills that you need to be a good orchestral musician or a good chamber musician? If everyone's on zoom, what can we talk about? What projects can we do that are layered? What can we do live? You know, what can you do this, that, and the other? So it's been like a whole creative process, I think for everybody in the field. Um, but yeah, I've really enjoyed like trying to figure out like, again, kind of what, what all are the things that we do as musicians and how can we do it even though we're apart and all by ourselves in our little rooms. Yeah. And, and now you get to curate art and lyrics and kind of put it all together and you've got this other beautiful project. And normally we wouldn't have time to do that because your other schedule is so busy. 
totally. I've always wanted to do a thing. Um, I think it was my sister's idea actually of doing, um, like with art museums, like doing, um, a chamber music, uh, art museum thing for exhibits, like where whatever the exhibit is, it's like, then you find music that goes along with that or like, um, like wine pairings with food and wine and music. Like there's so many cool, cool things we can do. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's nice to have a little bit of time to think these things over, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for this. This has been so much fun. Such a pleasure. So cool. Thank you for joining us on Inside the Notes. Be sure to visit insidethenotes.com for additional content from our artists and guests and click subscribe to stay up to date on future interviews. Until next time, this is your host, Erica Block.